Good evening, everyone. <coughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening on this uh, happy occasion. Uh, I'm David Madigan, Executive Vice President and Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences uh, here at Columbia. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event. Um, this event is organized by the European Institute with the co-sponsorship of the Technology, Media, Advocacy and Communications Specialization at SIPA, our School for International Public Affairs, um, and, the, and of the Alliance Programme. Um, it is my great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome back Ambassador Matthew Barzen, um, Ambassador of the United States to the United Kingdom. Um, Ambassador, we had the privilege of hosting you here at Columbia last year for a discussion at our World Leaders Forum, um, and I'm particularly delighted to welcome you back uh, this evening for a talk on the challenges of 21st century diplomacy and the role of modern day diplomats, um, a topic you know a lot about. Um, ambassador Barzan has been U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom since 2013, um, and he served before as the Ambassador to Sweden from 2009 to 2011. Prior to his diplomatic posts, Ambassador Barzan was the Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President of CNET Networks, a pioneer internet company, um, still an important internet company. Uh, he also held leadership positions in both of President Obama's presidential uh, campaigns. Since we are here at Columbia University um, and here at La Maison Francaise, um, I would also like to, to say that Ambassador Barzan is the grandson of Professor Jacques Barzan, who was one of our most illustrious professors uh, here at Columbia. Um, and Ambassador Barzan's son is here tonight, who is also Jacques Barzan. Um, uh, Jacques Barzan was born in France. Jacques Barzan, the elderly one, not the younger one, uh, was born in France and educated at Columbia after World War I. He was passionate about helping bring together, bringing together European and American cultures. He was a founder of the discipline of cultural history, a leading public intellectual, and at the same time a very deeply committed educator. Um, and I noticed today that uh, he actually uh, wrote 40 books uh, in his lifetime, which is a staggering uh, productivity and on a whole range of, of uh, topics. Um, so it is a great pleasure to celebrate the legacy of Jacques Barzon as we welcome you, Ambassador, this evening. Thank you for being with us. I'm also delighted to welcome members of your family who are joining us for this event. Um, I would also like to introduce Professor Adam Tews, sitting right here, who is the Catherine and Shelby Colum Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute, um, and who will moderate the discussion and the question and answer session uh, with, the, with the audience. Um, our talk this evening is part of the European Institute Lecture Series. Previous speakers in this series have included, among others, David Miliband, Samantha Power, and Joe Biden. Uh, we have also had the pleasure to welcome at the, uh, this series the European Union High Representative and Vice President of the European Commission, Frederica, Federica Mogherini, two weeks ago. The EI Lecture Series offers wonderful opportunities to foster dialogue between the Columbia community and foreign policy leaders from Europe and America. And that's why we're particularly delighted to welcome back Ambassador Barzan, uh, who will share with us his experiences um, as, a, as an American envoy in Europe in, in two different countries. Now, the timing of this talk is very fortunate, uh, as the State Department just announced this week the selection of Ambassador Barzan as the winner of the 2016 Sue M. Cobb Award for Exemplary Diplomatic Service. The selection committee of the award was impressed with Ambassador Barzan's vision for the future of diplomacy. It emphasized that Ambassador, this is a quote, Ambassador Barzan took the Embassy London show on the road. His Beyond London initiative sent embassy teams to 40 cities from Plymouth and Exeter at the southernmost tip of the island to small towns in southwest Wales to Sunderland, Durham and Newcastle in the north. Please join me in congratulating Ambassador Barzan on this prestigious award. Ambassador, it's been a very eventful year uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, a bit of an understatement, um, since, you last, since you last visited us. You, you've proposed to reflect with us on how modern diplomats can help foster connections in a time of increasing public unease. You've summarized diplomats' new missions in the title of your talk, Housekeeping, Bridge Building, and Apple Pie. Uh, we very much look forward to hearing your thoughts um, and your recipes, and I'll now give the floor to Ambassador Barzan. Uh, but before that, please, please join me again in welcoming you. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. When people say nice things about me, it doesn't happen every day or even every month, I often say, gosh, I wish my mother were here. <laughs> and my mother is here. So this is really a special joy.
And it is a joy to be back here at Columbia for all the reasons David mentioned, uh, so many family connections. Uh, and my grandfather's daughter, my Aunt Isabel, is here and her husband Gavin, so hello and uh, welcome to both of you. I was tempted because I had so much fun last year um, and some of you were here and I was thinking about this fall and being at Columbia and I was tempted to, as I look at three and a half months left in what will be my three and a half years serving as the ambassador in the UK and to be here at Columbia, I thought, well, this is fun. I mean, we could go back to the sort of special relationship, you know, FDR with his Columbia Law School connections and go all the way up to the current administration and Barack Obama and his Columbia connections, and we could kind of focus on that bit. Or we could go way, way back to the awkward 1776 and all that and King's College into Columbia College and embrace the awkwardness of that uh, and then think about a certain Alexander Hamilton who has kind of, you know, come to life uh, in, in, in the minds of lots of us, including lots of young people, because of what Lin-Manuel Miranda has done, which, by the way, he just showed up in London, so he's now casting the London version of Hamilton. So, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that because I don't know how you all are feeling, but I am feeling a sense of unease about what's happening on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, now it is true that, and President Obama does remind us, that statistically speaking there is no better time to be alive than right now. Right, in the sense that if you were to pick any time to be alive, and you couldn't pick where you were born or to whom you were born, you would pick now because you're most likely to live beyond infancy, you're most likely to live something like a full life in something either free or close to free. So that's all true and the, and the, the data backs it up. And yet we don't live statistically, so it doesn't, it's not actually much comfort, I don't think. Um, and you look at it and you think, you know, sort of both sides of the political aisle, on both sides of the Atlantic, people are really questioning the motivations and the actions of leaders of public institutions and private institutions. And they're even questioning the value of these systems that the U.S. and the U.K., these international rules-based systems that the U.S. and the U.K. have built up since the time of Sir Winston and FDR over these last seven decades. People seem to be sort of talking at each other, talking past each other, and there seems to be this gulf that's growing. And so I think about that, um, and I ask myself, well, where did this come from, and how might each of us do something about it? And that's what I wanted to share what I've been thinking about and then open it up for your suggestions and insights. Sound good? Okay. Um, so where did, we, where did this all come from? And I, I was, one of the great parts of this job in London is we get all these amazing visitors from the United States government coming through London. We have a term of art for this. It's called visit nights. So we just completed our fiscal year, September 30th. We had 24,000 visit nights last year through the London Embassy. So picture an army general and her four staff spending two nights, that's 10 visit nights. We had 24,000 um, and it's amazing. Uh, and one of these people um, I had a meeting with, he's a law, law enforcement professional. And I would like to say that it was you know, a day before my meeting, I was reading up on my memo, but truth be told, it was five minutes before the meeting and I'm flipping through the memo about who is this guy and why am I meeting with him, and I read his bio, his CV, and it's really impressive. And the thing he had done right before his current job was he was the guy, one of the many people sent in by the Justice Department into communities where the trust between law enforcement and the communities have so tragically broken down. Right, so you can think Ferguson, Missouri, but you know that's not the only community that has been uh, wrestling with this. So, I asked him a question, and we'll talk later about what I've learned from all these young people in the UK, but police brutality is a major concern of British young people about what's happening in our country. So I asked him, you know, how he did his work and what he learned, and he told me this story, and he said, well, every place I go, I do two things right when I get to town. And step one is I get a group, basically the size of tonight's group, from all over the community, a diverse sort of um, group of people, and I put one word up on the PowerPoint. No, 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 sorry, it's okay. It, it's a, it's a, you can have to use your imagination for this one. 
And then he asked them all to think of the first word that pops into their mind. And, and we're not going to play the game, but think what it would be for you. And the word is housekeeper. Got it? Housekeeper. So he puts up the word housekeeper, and, and then he, get, he gets people to share. Like, you know, Nancy, what were you thinking? And Bob, what were you thinking? And he does this, and you'd expect, you get 100 people in a room, you get, you know, 50 to 100 different answers. Some people write down their mother because she worked as a housekeeper to put them through college, or promotion because they wish they'd get one so they could hire a housekeeper once a month, or they might write Downton Abbey, or they might write hard work, or they might write a certain immigrant group that had arrived in that town or city that was disproportionately um, taking those sorts of jobs to integrate into the economy. So anyway, a wide variety of responses, that's part one. Part two, he goes and gets his fellow law enforcement, the police men and women from that community, gets them all in a room, same thing, housekeeper, and guess what he tells me? They nearly all write the exact same word. Thief. And I had the same reaction to, I heard from many, I was like, what? And he said, yeah, he said, well, think about it. These men and women are perfectly curious and smart like, like everyone else. They just generally grew up in families that didn't have enough money to hire a housekeeper. And they don't get paid enough to hire a housekeeper. So the only housekeepers they ever meet are people they meet on the job who are accused of or guilty of stealing something. Right? And we know the lingo. I mean, the lingo, and it's in the news these days, um, is uh, implicit bias. Right? And, th and that is something that is really important. So he said that, and, and then we got on to the actual business of the meeting. But I reflected on that, and I thought, okay, well, what are the words that I am using as a diplomat that I think, and my fellow people and many here in the room, who are committed to international relations, whether you're in business or academia or government, and I say these things all the time. Here are some examples. Uh, international rules-based order. Intellectual property protection. Um, free trade and investment deals. I mean, I must say those things, you know, a hundred times a day. And I think they're benign or neutral or helpful, like housekeeper. And clearly, a whole bunch of people on, in this country and back in the United Kingdom hear those words and they think thief. And then the other thing I've reflected on is, what are the words that other people are saying to me and my fellow diplomats or people who care about uh, the transatlantic relationship, they mean them in a kind of benign to neutral way, except we're hearing them as thief and we feel our arms start folding and our fists start clenching and our fingers start pointing. What are those hot buttons people are pushing with their words with us that we don't even realize? And so how might we do something about that? And for me, it is a really simple bit of advice which was given to me right after I left the internet business and was about to go serve as a diplomat in Sweden. And I got a chance to be with President Obama. He just got elected. I got to go into the Oval Office uh, before I left. And I really only had one question I wanted to ask him. So we chit-chatted for a little bit and then we sat down. The chairs were like this, a different material. They weren't sort of lucite, but we sat down and I just said it. I said, Mr. President, what advice would you have for me as a first-time ambassador? And I remember it like it was yesterday. He looked up at the ceiling, he thought for a moment, and he said, well, Matthew, listen. And I already had my pen out at that point, and uh, I thought to myself, and did not say, yes, Mr. President, why do you think I came all this way from Kentucky? I was planning to listen. And I had my black book, and I just sat there. And that's all he said. And you guys are quicker than I was. It was a long, awkward pause <laughs> as I sat there. And of course, he wasn't saying, listen to all my pearls of wisdom. He was just saying, listen, just listen. So I tried to do that in Sweden, and I tried to do that in the United Kingdom. And one group I really wanted to focus on was people under 18. Because, I mean, quite technically, the cliche, I mean, they are the future of this special relationship. They don't have fond memories of, you know, World War II is a long, long time ago. Um, you can call them the 9-11 generation. They were four when that happened. So it's not like that was a visceral thing like it is for many of us in this room. Um, so I went around and I met with over 18,000 18 year olds. And I do, a, I do, I don't call it art therapy because they would be creeped out by that, but it's kind of what it is. I give them a blank piece of paper and a pencil and I say, please draw me a picture of something that frustrates, concerns, or confuses you about the United States. And if you don't want to draw a picture, you can write a word. 
and they do that, or a cartoon, and they do that, and then I, flip, I say flip it over, draw a picture, or write a word of something that inspires, gives you hope, or you like about the United States. And I just want to share with you quickly what they wrote. Now, if you go to a college campus like Columbia or Oxford or UCL or King's College or Newcastle University and you show up and you're the American ambassador, you will get a bunch of really bright international relations poli-sci students and teachers and they will, I've played the game with them too, you will hear things like Guantanamo Bay surveillance, Israel-Palestine, our support of Israel, war, oil, that kind of thing. And that absolutely comes up at these sessions that I do. Thank you. And I've put in blue here foreign policy and in red, can you guys see it over there? In red I put things we would as Americans think of as domestic policy and as you can see the domestic policy issues far, far outweigh So that's after 18,000. And we spend the bulk of our time talking about that. And at the end, we save a little time for what I call the happy bit, which is what do you like, what gives you hope, what you inspire. And I think things like freedom you would sort of expect, things like food I wouldn't have, but um, <laughs> sports, TV, things you can touch, things you can't touch, conceptual things, tac tactile things. <laughs> We'll leave that one up. It's a happy one. We'll let that remain the backdrop here for a second. Um, so I was, uh, the New York Times wrote a story about this work when I had gotten to the 100 high school mark. And someone in the British government read it and very kindly invited me to come talk to a group of sort of uh, diplomats and policy makers in the UK. And I presented a, like a deep version of this, like this stuff plus a whole bunch of data about what I had learned. Um, and as I'm giving the pitch, and I, I think it's kind of, I, mean, I love it, and I think it's neat, there's a guy sitting in the front row who is slightly too polite to just go like this. <laughs> but I mean, this guy is hating it. Hating it. So it comes time, I open it up for, for questions, and this guy, and I'm not picking on Adam, but he was sitting like right there where Adam is. And so he raises his hand. I thought, okay, great, I'll call on this guy. So I said, yes. And he says, uh, what do all those pretty pictures have to do with policy? And then he went on. And he, it wasn't a question. You know, it, was, it was a whole bunch of, hey, that's fine. Um, what are those things? And he's like, you know, I, talk, I told the listening story about President Obama. He's like, listening, everyone listens. I mean, big deal. Listening is like motherhood and apple pie. And I am not one of those people who is able to, in the moment, come up with the quick and clever thing to say. It's a wonderful skill. I don't have it. So I got really defensive. And I gave a pretty lame answer. And I'm not going to bore you with the lame answer, but I felt my voice go up like three levels. And I was like, no, 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 this isn't policy. This is, this is um, engagement or some buzzword. Um, I do policy. Of course I do policy. Look what we're doing on Russia, Ukraine. Look what we're doing on countering ISIL. Look what we're doing on Ebola. Um, look what we're doing on climate change. And I started to just do the sort of laundry list of things that the US and the UK do together around the world. He was unimpressed by the answer. And it has bugged me ever since because I think he actually asked the right question. I just gave the wrong answer. And as I've reflected on it, I think some of the seeds of the right answer were in his question. Motherhood and apple pie. I mean, motherhood, for starters, and I'm not just saying it because my mom's here. I mean, skipping over motherhood and taking that for granted seems silly because quite literally none of us would be here without motherhood. But I won't dwell on motherhood. Um, apple pie. Now, my little brother got married recently, and his best friend stood up and gave a toast. And I'll never forget it. And here's what he said. He told a story of when they were younger, and uh, they were actually having, uh, trying to impress the grown-ups, including my aunt and uncle here, and a whole bunch of grown-ups. They were going to cook dinner for the grown-ups. Um, 
And his best friend Jay, who was giving the toast, knew how to cook a little bit. My little brother Charles really did not. And his friend Jay says, we're cooking apple pie. And Charles looks like, ah, I don't know. And he's like, I'm not so sure. And his friend assures him, it's okay, Charles. It's simple. So they get to work. And they're chopping apples, and they're peeling apples, and they're chopping apples, and they're peeling apples. The grown-ups are coming. The clock keeps moving. And dinner is about to be served. And the apple pie is still in peeling and cutting mode. And so my brother turns to his best friend and says, Jay, exasperated, Jay, you told me this would be easy. And his friend Jay shot back, no, I didn't. I said it would be simple. <laughs> and it is. It is simple and hard and time consuming and repetitive and meaningful, just like marriage. <laughs> right? Just like marriage. And I would add, just like motherhood, just like fatherhood, just like listening, and just like diplomacy. So my answer, I wish I could have given to that guy that day, is, sir, listening is policy. Listening is policy. And it works. And I've seen it work. And if you listen, people hear you differently. And I've seen this on the political campaign where you see those great images of Barack Hussein Obama in 2007 talking to 12 people in an Iowa cornfield. And then you fast forward to him talking to 2 million people on the mall. And yes, it's true that he's an amazing speaker, but I was there in those cornfields in Iowa and it wasn't him giving some soaring oration. It was him listening to the concerns of those people in Iowa, really listening and asking them for help so that he could try to go do something about it. And then I've seen, once he got into office, whether it's beginning to normalize relations with Cuba, whether it's trying to get 196 countries together on climate change, or whether it is the Iran nuclear deal, which he identified was the number one security threat to our country, through a lot of back channel at first, and then official negotiations and lots of listening involved in that, led to the Iran nuclear deal without a single shot being fired or a single troop getting deployed. So I think it really works and all of that listening, whether on the foreign policy or the political front, is hard. You know what I think is not hard? What is in fact easy? Building walls. I just, my lovely wife and uh, Three children just moved back from London, so I had to help pack up the stuff. And our youngest son has tons of Legos, and I remember just looking at this big drawer, putting it into a box, and I thought to myself, if we were to give everyone here in this room a box, a, you know, a pile of Legos, and said, "We're coming back in 30 seconds, quick, build a bridge or build a wall," same score for each. What would you build? You probably build a wall. I mean, anyone can do that. You just stand in one place and you start stacking. Building bridges, it's easy to say as a diplomat, it's actually hard to do. And I think it takes three things to build a wall. I'm sorry, three things to build a bridge. First, you have to see yourself. You have to know where you stand and what you stand for. And then, you have to do the second thing. You have to see the other. Not just tolerate the other, but really see them and acknowledge the other. And then you have to do this third thing. And those first two things are hard enough. You have to actually see yourself in the other. You have to kind of explore the other shore. And that's what I've been reflecting on. And I think each of us in our own way needs to find ways to see yourself, see the other, see yourself in the other. It is as hard and as simple as that. And with that, I would love to take President Obama's advice to heart in this moment and listen to your observations and your suggestions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, I had the pleasure of doing this job uh, last year, and at one level it's an impossible task with a performer like this. My job is to ask a few questions and get out of the way um, so that he can interact with you guys. But on the other hand, I was really looking forward to you coming. It's a pleasure to have you back. 
Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to host you as part of the European Institute. But at a strictly personal level, I was just looking forward to it because you're so upbeat, you're so cheerful, you're so creative in your thinking. Well, thank you. And at this particular moment, um, your, as it were, third characterization of our state right now is, for my personal feeling, a kind of massive understatement of our condition. You describe mm. the situation as somewhat concerning, we have a slight sense of unease. As a European who has the misfortune of having a UK passport right now, a slight sense of unease doesn't really mm. quite gra capture it. And as a father of a teenage daughter who also has an American passport, slight unease doesn't quite cut it either. Yeah. There's something really quite profound going on. And then I got to thinking about this story that, and this extraordinary work you've been doing in talking to young people. So I want to, you know I want to take you to policy, but I'm going to start in your place. This extraordinary work you've been doing in talking about to young people. And then I think back to the Brexit referendum, and I can't help wondering whether you're talking to the right people. Because as we know from the breakdowns afterwards, it's the old people who screwed up my country's future for everyone else. And it's their concerns. It's the people over 40 who mm. voted, who turned out in droves to vote, and made this cataclysmic decision by strictly democratic mechanisms, though of course there's no place for referenda really in the British Constitution. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the democratic force of this has to be taken seriously. And so I guess what I wanted to get to was this question of, and it goes back to your point about walls, right? What, do you, what was your sense of the prevailing scatter chart of concerns in that chunk? of the British population, which are less attractive to talk to, less interesting, but in the end proved politically decisive. Um, and what is your sense of that group and how do we engage with their concerns and their fears? Because though the future belongs to the youth, they inherit it from the old people. Well, yeah. If they screw it up, then their inheritance is, 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 is a rotten one. Sure. I mean, look, I. The only thing I right towards the end, you said that's a group that's less attractive to talk to. Not for me. And I'm a kid who grew up in outside of Boston, Massachusetts, who lives in Kentucky. Right? Like I don't fit in. I don't sound like I'm from Kentucky. So I think there is really good. Um, I like talking to people who don't agree with me, um, and I think we ought to all do more of it. I mean, a fun little test is, how many people here like to lose an argument? No one ever raises their hand. And so why do we train our young people to be argument winners? And why do we spend so much of our time and energy or Sunday morning talk shows arguing if no one likes to be on the other end of a losing argument? So, so that's just one quibble that I think this is really important. I mean, I didn't go out and talk to a bunch of, I mean, I was just up in Lincoln and Boston the British Lincoln in Boston. I grew up in Lincoln near Boston in, um, in Massachusetts, so I had to go see where it all came from, which was like 80-20 Brexit yep. over, over Remain. Um, but I spent most of the time with the young people all over, you know, working class Glasgow, rural Scotland, Northern Ireland, Newcastle, all over. Um, and I would ask them, I mean, it was, it was a long exercise. I did all these clicker questions, and I'd ask them, I'm going to list five issues you've read about in the news, please anonymously, they had little clickers, vote on which one's most important to you. Number one, Middle East peace. Number two, UK's relationship with the European Union, ISIS, ISIL, terrorism, Ukraine, Russia, and climate change. Those were the five. And we asked them consistently over three years. Never, never, never pre-referendum, before June 23rd, did number two, which is UK's relationship with the European Union, ever get above 5%. No, I mean, look, I mean, ter competing with number three, terrorism, I mean, that um, would usually win. Climate change, which we thought sort of young people, maybe 10%. So, I mean, it wasn't really on their mind. In one of these sessions after the referendum, a young woman in the back said, um, I hadn't heard this suggestion. She's like, this is ridiculous. We should have gotten a percentage, each of our votes should have been counted based on an actuarial table. Yeah, life expectancy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I was like, oh, wow. I mean, yeah. it's not, not my role to be for or against that, but that's an interesting yeah. idea. Um, uh, and look, it's a tricky one for me to get into now that it's happened. We made our position clear 
um, which made lots of people happy that we spoke up as friends, and President Obama did it, and Secretary Kerry. Um, lots of people were unhappy um, that we did. But I'm glad we did, because if we'd woken up on June 24th and we hadn't said what we really felt as friends, I, th I think, certainly I personally would have regretted it. Well, that brings me to my, my second question before I, before I open things up, which is, America did make very clear what its preference was. The administration stated it clearly. Um, and let's set aside the question of the electorate. It's very unclear, I think, whether the British political leadership listened or knew what to do having listened. And that would not be the first time. I mean, you assume the ambassadorship months after the uh, Syria debacle, where the Obama administration had clearly been expecting a favorable vote. No, no, six days before. Six days before. Oh, you, so the Wikipedia has been late in the year. Six yeah. days before. <laughs> six days before. Yeah. So, but you take my point. Yeah. Book ended by Syria at one end, the Asian Investment and Development Bank in the middle, uh, where again the British take the lead amongst European pets, or very, they're very fr at the front of the queue in signaling their willingness to go along with the yeah. Chinese. And then this at the end, as a historian trying to sort of sublimate my anxiety and stress about this moment in a kind of <laughs> professional way, I'm tempted to say we're going to look back at this period as one of a really, on key issues, not on everything, there's going to be the apple pie issues of climate change and so on where everyone can agree, but on key strategic geopolitical issues where the United States expected London to line up, and not just any London, but a Tory government. Was, was asked to line up, or was clearly suggested where, and the leadership was simply not there. So for me, I guess the question is, how, how did that feel? Uh, what sense do you make of it? Like, does it feel like a moment of crisis, speaking frankly? Yeah. And what would be your advice for your successor as to what to yeah. expect in future? If America makes its position clear on the key foreign policy issue, on a Syria, on an absolutely fundamental issue with regard to the future of economic development, China, relations with China, and then on Europe, and in each case, Washington can no longer rely on a, even really the signs of much effort on the part of, of Downing Street, which that's the embarrassing thing, right, both in the case of Syria well, and with, with Brexit. But anyway, you take my point, a, a I major, do. some of it, a major um, a ten moment of tension here. Yeah, look, I mean, I think so, so six days into the job, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, for those of you not scoring at home on this thing, had recalled Parliament early to ask if British military force would be used against the Assad regime. This is pre-ISIS, so this is for his use of chemical weapons against the, uh, the thing, and he, he lost the vote. The front page of the biggest selling newspaper in the country, I have it printed out and framed on my wall. It, has a, it says death notice, front page above the fold, death notice, special relationship, dead, age 67, beloved offspring, blah, 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 funeral to be held at the French embassy. <laughs> awesome. Like snarky, clever, oh, and by the way, not true, you know, that it like died that day. Look, we had the same, I mean, ours didn't end up going to a vote in the same way, but we were struggling. I think both electorates, both groups of citizens had been through two really long, costly, in every definition of that word, massive wars together and we're tired of it. I mean, uh, so I, I see a lot more similarity um, than I do difference among the people of both countries who elect their leaders. Um, AWIB I think is a, probably not widely followed here, maybe a little bit, but um, I think not as big a deal um, I think the proof is in the pudding. The UK said, we will go team up with this Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank and we will get them to live up to high standards so they don't undercut the other Asia Infrastructure Banks and EBRD, other things we've set up and do a race to the bottom. And so far, I think it's good. They are holding up to high standards and that would be a good thing because we welcome the peaceful rise of China and want them to be constructive and play by the international rules. So I think that's where the UK can be really helpful. Um, I never think as a personal matter, if you find yourself saying don't, don't, don't too often to children, to friends, to spouses, 
you should just really wonder mm -hmm. what's going on because it's much more compelling to say, please do join, please do help. Um, so that, I think, uh, would be the focus. And look, on Brexit, I mean, I, you never know what it's like to be in someone else's marriage. So if a friend comes to you and says, we're thinking of getting divorced, do you have an opinion? It's like really hard not to have an opinion. It's like, you guys are so fun to go out with. You know, we get along really well. We do great stuff together. Uh, so, if you, so you, of course you have an opinion. Of course there's a big selfish motivation to it. Not only selfish. I mean, you think, I, you guys seem good together. Well, I hope you work it out. Um, but you'll never, you say that from the outside. We don't know what it's like to be in the European Union. We just don't. Um, but from our position, we thought it would stay in. In terms of the last part of advice to the future uh, person, uh, whoever comes after me, um, you've given me an idea. I should actually. There's a great British tradition of writing. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have we don't have quite the same tradition yet. Or maybe we did, but I haven't heard of it. I didn't get one certainly on the way in. Um, Your successor needs one. Uh, but what I would say, I, I would go to a, a, a one of the. Uh, thinkers that my grandfather Barzan loved was William James. I don't know if we have any William James scholars here in the house. Okay, good. Um, so I can quote him. So to paraphrase William James, uh, he said in his Principles of Psychology, he said, you know, we, y you think you smile because you're happy, but you're actually happy because you smile. But you can try it. You know, it's like, it was actually laughter, not smiling. But I like the... Um, and that you flip it around afterwards, but it really does, the, the activity of doing it makes it. And I think sometimes we go, fall into a similar trap with our US-UK special relationship, that we think we do hard things together because we're friends. Like fight together. I think we're friends because we do hard things together. And so nothing is more creepy than like sitting down and being like, let's be friends. <laughs> but like seeking, it's like seeking happiness. It is a byproduct of other things. If you chase it and grasp for it, you're probably guaranteed not to get it. Mm -hmm. So I look around the world, Brexit, all those things you mentioned, we are still working together to try to defeat ISIS, ISIL. Everyone skips over Ebola now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But those kids used to write down. I mean, they were freaked out. A million people might die by Christmas a year and a half ago. And did it solve itself? No. A whole bunch of brave women and men from the UK and from our country, with big help from our respective militaries, went to a place really far away to team up with their brothers and sisters in the medical profession in those three countries to save people they never met, will never see again. And it worked. And that's just remarkable. And, and sadly, there will be another Ebola. And so ha we, we've gotten stronger and we stood up and really helped the world together. And I think we need to do more things like that. I knew you'd cheer me up. Um, <laughs> so the, the rules of the game are, I, I'm going to throw the floor open. Um, when you ask a question, when I call on you, can you please stand up so the cameras can catch you and uh, tell the ambassador who you are? Very briefly, just my name is X from Columbia or whatever. So can I have the first question? I'll take Matt Connolly at the front here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matt Connolly. I'm in the history department. So as the grandson of an historian and as someone who's witnessed a lot of history and made history even, I'm wondering if you could uh, look to the future 30 years out and imagine people like me trying to reconstruct like how it is that, you know, things happen or didn't happen. And when we work in uh, the period from 30 years ago, you know, we'll open people's files like Henry Kissinger and he's got lots of them. It's paper and you can read it and you can kind of reconstruct what happened. But whether you know, we look at things like the Clinton email or the Iraq inquiry in the UK, the consensus now among archivists is that all that's gone. You know, all we're going to get if we get anything are just you know, strings of email or text messages. And probably we won't get that, or not much of it. So I'm just wondering if you could kind of look ahead and imagine how it is somebody's going to tell that story. Well, I remember my grandfather bars and I cannot remember in what book. Um, he said, you know, it's really, there's this real temptation on the part of historians or family members. If you, discover, if you discover someone's long lost, long hidden diary, in the American sense of the word diary, not calendar, you know. Um, and it's really hard not to think as a historian or as someone who just learns about it that that must be the real so and so. And he reminds us, he's like, that's not the real so and so, that is a subset 
of so-and-so and the things they thought and felt that they couldn't express elsewhere in their lives to their spouse, to their children, to their colleagues and this, so it's a really maybe important, maybe not important, but if you don't know the full spectrum of what else they were doing and saying, so you have a piece, you don't have the whole thing, you don't have the Rosetta Stone of what made that person tick necessarily. Um, so that's one comment on the sort of historian on that one, but um, uh, perspective. I think, we talked about freedom, Matt, we were talking about freedom of information stuff earlier and you were sharing some of Tony Blair's opinions on it. I mean, it is, there's this word that is very, that is used all the time on both sides of the Atlantic, and I'll get to it in a moment, that sounds really tempting and I think it's really dangerous. Um, and there was this, I'll get to it in one second. The, um, you know, every year, it's great doing this job, because usually the US and the UK are like number one and number two on lists that are, you want to be number one or number two on, right? Like, biggest givers of aid to the devastating crisis in Syria. Number one and number two. Number one and number two givers of aid around the world. I mean, this is all really stuff we shouldn't take for granted. We should be really proud of. Um, educational attainment, K through 12. We're like 26th and 27th. You know, it's just depressing. And the country that always wins is Finland. Now, when you work in Sweden, you're very aware of that because it's right next door and they're just, and they're coming like seventh, but they're like, what is up with the Finns? And occasionally they use, lose to Singapore, but then they win the next year. So. The guy who ran the, and by the way, they're all state schools, they're all state funded. Um, people in New York tend to bring, fly him over to pick his brain so that we can figure out how to get our schools better. Um, and he wrote a great article and he said, well, they always ask me the same question in a setting like this. The first hand is like, what are you gonna do about teacher accountability? And so he leans over to his Finnish American friend and he's like, we don't, they speak English just as well as Americans do or the Swedes do. He said, we don't have a word for accountability. <laughs> But he learned from his Finnish American friend, he gets the idea, he goes, ah, I see what you mean. It's that thing you have left, accountability is that thing you have left after you've removed responsibility. And I was like, wow, okay. It is thin and it is nasty and it is code for, it's a thing, I'm not denying it. But it's like lust is a part of love, it's just not the full and interesting part of love, but it's there. So accountability is thin and narrow and it is code for how do I haul you in front of my committee? How do I fire you? And you, you will get, if you demand accountability, you will start getting that kind of body language and that kind of reaction from people as opposed to encouraging responsibility, which is a much fuller concept. It's the difference between sort of a glass of red wine and a glass of grappa. A glass of grappa is good for sort of one thing, a glass of red wine is good for a whole lot of things. <laughs> I think. Do you have someone? Oh, we got, yes, woman here. Yes. Hello, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Um, my name is Carla Coley. I'm a master's student in the dual history, international history program. And in my previous life, I was deputy chief of staff to the British ambassador, Peter Westmacott. Um, so I, That's something so that cool. came up both in that life and in this life is, are we asking the right questions? And you brought it up in your talk that the gentleman who approached you, was what, he'd asked the right questions. So I just was asking, going forward, what are the right questions? What should we be asking? Ooh, great one. And uh, I just was with Sir Peter last week uh, mm -hmm. and loved working with him. Um, so what are the right questions we should be asking uh, you know, across the Atlantic? Um, well, I think a big one is, um, is what I've learned from these kids is we, we make the distinction between foreign policy and domestic policy. I put the red ones and the blue ones. The fact is America and the UK are purple. Like the, these young people in the UK, in your country, make no distinction between domestic policy and foreign policy. So if they perceive, and it's really cool, I mean, they hold us to really high standards. We're not their country, but they expect us, and if they see a mismatch between what we're saying and what we think we're all about and what we're doing, on the domestic front, that makes them trust what we're trying to do internationally a lot less. So that's one um, thing. Um, and then the other, I think, is just, one of those 24,000 visit nights, we get a lot of what are called CODELs, which are congressional delegations. So it's a great chance to meet lots of Republican and Democratic lawmakers. 
when they come through and I was with this wonderful Republican guy who shall remain nameless and we were sort of in between meetings and we were a lovely guy and we're going between and he asked me a question I'm not getting political but he just asked he said hey which of the two candidates running for president here uh, some poll had come out talks more about the issues so I fell squarely and quickly right into his trap and I wasn't I just I assume Secretary Clinton I don't know she seems to be a policy person and he just started smiling before I was done he said ah you made the fateful mistake you thought issues were policy he's like those are not synonyms issues are things people feel and care about and policy are things that policymakers make and presumably they meet up at some point but they're just not the same thing and I think in diplomacy and in government and a bit you can get into your policy bubble and you think policies are what people care about um, could I add right on that does the UK ambassador do this kind of exercise with American 18 year olds yeah. and, well, not the same thought bubble, but he does speak to that Right. What 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 impression do you get of American eighteen-year-olds' visions of Britain? How thick is the map? How many different words are there on there? And what kind of words are there? I'm sure there's a diplomatic answer for it. And unfortunately, I'm not trained well enough. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Don't go changing. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps the ambassador can reach out to the ambassador. For another question. And get, get no, an yeah. gentleman at the back. Yeah, you can wait for the mic, sir. We don't mind. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Joseph Mendez. My son came, uh, graduated from Columbia three years ago. He's at a hedge fund, so I'm not sure what I did wrong. But um, my, so my, that's my connection to Columbia. But my question really is, what does Brexit do to the relationship between the United States and Britain? Does it bring them together more on trade? Does it bring them more together on sort of skepticism about uh, Russia? I mean, the, are, are there any good things about Brexit in terms of the relationship between Britain and the United States. Because most of what you read in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, is Brexit is bad all over for, for, for any number of you know, areas. And it's bad for presumably the relationship of Britain to, you know, besides Europe, uh, to the United States. But is it? Sure. Um what we used to say before June 23rd, the U.S. stated policy uh, going back a long time, uh, I mean across uh, Republican and Democratic administrations was very simple and I, I must have said it a thousand times. We want a strong UK in a strong EU. Mm. Yeah. And then we'd always preface it before June 23rd, of course it's up to you guys, blah 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 blah, and then of course it's up to you guys. And if we didn't say it twice, they'd only quote the middle bit and we would be perceived as being bossy and finger pointy, which isn't helpful. Um, and to be very oversimplified, but I also think true, only one word has changed June 24th until now, and it's that middle word. Now we want a strong UK and a strong EU. So from my perspective and my job, we've always sort of been working on the strong UK piece. And if you look at all the stuff we do around the world together, ISIL, you know, ISIL, Ebola, climate, most of those things don't need to be impacted at all by the British people's decision to leave Europe. Um, not totally unaffected, but largely unaffected. Um, the Ukraine one you mentioned is one that is a real big deal. I mean, you've got Russia trying to redraw the boundaries of Europe at the barrel of a gun in 2014, 2015, 2016, the UK was an amazing voice within the European Union getting all those 27 other countries to hold firm on not only putting sanctions in place but rolling them over every six months which is a ton of diplomatic effort to just keep that going. Um, when they're out that will be a really strong and credible voice missing from that table that would make things like that I would think harder, not impossible, but that's a it doesn't mean they can't have a role. I mean, Japan plays a role doing sanctions. I mean, so they still can do that, but we got sort of a two for one deal because they could do it as a major economy and as a member of this institution. Looking for a question from over here. Yes, lady here. 
Hi, I'm Ulla Dukkart. I'm head of public diplomacy at the Danish consulate here in New York. Oh. Um, and to me, listening to you speaking about going around the country, speaking to 18-year-olds, issues over policy, is essential public diplomacy. Uh, and uh, Hillary Clinton, as uh, Secretary of State, in fact, defined 21st uh, century diplomacy as smart power, not hard power, not soft power, but the full scale, all the mm. tools in the diplomatic toolbox, including public diplomacy. Meanwhile, we're, of course, seeing situations around the world where it is back to talking about boots on the ground, the red line for Syria, and so on. Uh, and the big interview with President Obama, the Obama Doctrine interview he did, obviously also uh, circled around these topics a lot. So my question is, how do you view the role of public diplomacy um, as a tool uh, in the current situation, foreign policy situations we see around the world? Thank you. I have to put in a plug for a friend of mine's TV show. He is Rufus Gifford. He's the U.S. Ambassador in Copenhagen. Uh, he happens to be a dear friend, so I'll get that out of, out of the way. You can get it on Netflix, and it's called I Am the Ambassador, and it's two seasons. Have you seen it? Absolutely. I mean, it is absolutely brilliant, and he, I don't think he'd mind me saying this. I, 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 there's no way he asked for permission before he did that. <laughs> I, I can't. I think he sort of asked for what he thought might be forgiveness, but this thing has been a huge hit. He won the... Um, so, yeah, Danish Television Awards for sort of best big personality, which is a weird translation except it's not Danish, they just say big personality in English, so I guess it isn't a weird translation. But anyway, um, and he and his husband, he just got married to a beautiful man named Stephen, and he is so honest in this thing, they have a camera rigged up in the car, so like he comes in, he sits in the back, because you don't do any driving as an ambassador. Um, and he like, he'll sit back, he's like, and the, he's just talking to the camera, he's like, well, that went badly. <laughs> you know, and he just says these things, and he's really, really honest, and the Danes really, really like it, and he doesn't try to be perfect, and he doesn't try to be all polished, and he does a lot of other things besides the TV show, but they're all captured on the TV show. It's two seasons long, and I think it is an unbelievable example of the right kind of uh, public diplomacy. Now, not everyone's going to want to go be in a documentary series like that. Um, that is his use of social media as well. He's very savvy on social media. Yeah, and he gets, and he's not afraid to mix it up. So, you know, there was that, I have to be careful with the Dane in the room, there was that story right when he got there. It wasn't the Syria vote. The big news coming out of Denmark was they chopped up a giraffe with a chainsaw? <laughs> well, no, but the, later they did. So they went back. They, they, it was like this big furor about like animal rights, and they did all this stuff. And it was the zoo. And then, no, he did. Then they went back, and they just showed the kids, like the little kids who came to the zoo. And it doesn't. I don't think strike Danes as all that weird, but it struck sort of the international community and people who were on Facebook as bizarre because they took this thing for a bunch of good reasons. If you run a zoo, they killed this animal, euthanized it. And then they showed the kids chopping it up to feed it to the lion. I'm, so he weighed in and he wrote this Facebook post that was so honest. And he basically said, look, I'm getting flooded by emails from, and oh, I should have mentioned his husband or then fiance is a large animal vet and is like an international. So it's like he's getting the whole thing. Who, and he just wrote this really honest sort of, look, this is thoughtful. I'm getting flooded. There's lots of good reasons. I'm learning more. I'll get back to you. I thought it was how any of us in our calmer moments would have responded. But he was on the front page of the big local, like often blotted type, saying like, butt out American, know it all, leave us alone, you know? So he, he's willing to go out there and say what he feels and take those hits. Um, and if you're willing to be responsible, you know, which I think he was, you're signing up for getting... Uh, hit. Anyway, so watch it. It's called I Am the Ambassador. It's on Netflix. It is just really good television and I think it contains the seeds of what people in diplomacy could do more of to get at public diplomacy. And to balance the public diplomacy and hard power and... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's both and. I mean, I think the, 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 my bad answer to that guy in the story I told you of like, oh, all of that stuff is just engagement and all this other stuff is serious policy. I just don't see that dichotomy. It's tempting to do that because when you get um, it, the, 
Okay, here's a quick one. I, really, I don't have a whiteboard, but I would say a great British author, Dorothy Sayers, wrote a great book that I also recommend, slightly less catchy than the Netflix series, called Mind of the Maker, and she talks about writing a book, and she says, look, there's the idea of the book, it's a triangle. Idea of the book, then you gotta go actually write the book, so the book as written, the book as idea, the book as written, and then the third corner of the triangle is the book as read. Make sense? Okay. So if you think about a policy, a foreign policy, there's the idea of the policy, and we reward people who come up with clever policy ideas. Then the hard work of like writing down the policy and rolling it out, we applaud people who do that. And yet with policy, you'd never forget that third corner of a book, but I think we do too much in foreign policy, and sort of hard foreign policy, of the policy as experienced. And that's what I think Ambassador Gifford's trying to do, I'm trying to do it in my way. That final piece of it all connects to hard or soft power. This gentleman here. I'm Vector Jermak. Um, Ambassador, I'm curious. Um, you represent Matthew, please. Matthew. Thank you. You represent the United States in our relations with the United Kingdom. But you also have your own views and your own thoughts. How do you interject those to try and change policy if you disagree with the official policy? And does it present some challenges to you at times? It's a great one. I am amazed. My career foreign service friends and colleagues are remarkable. So eight, you know, 75, 80% of our ambassadors on the US side are from the career foreign service. 20, 25% are people like me from the outside. They really have to live, and, and I, I would be much more interested in their answers to that question than mine because, look, I worked for a guy who appointed me who I used to work for on the campaign. So our alignment is, it's easy for me. I can imagine as my colleagues have to do working for someone, including our current president, whose policies you don't agree with. Um, and they're amazing professionals in their ability to do that. To not totally duck your good question, the only, the, the time it comes up for me, it's a slight tweak on, on what you were getting at, is with these young people because, you know, they're dying to talk about stuff I can't get into. I can't get into Clinton versus Trump or Bernie said, you know, it's not appropriate. So I don't, but they'll, they'll say some really hard stuff. and. A little thing I learned, so if I call on someone in the back and she says, you know, what's your frustration? And she says, um, your indiscriminate use of drones, killing civilians, um, you know, or something like that. And then I'll say, okay, and I have a butcher paper, whiteboard. So I write it and I just say exactly what she said out loud and I write up indiscriminate use of drones. And, and the act of just saying it out, like I'm not agreeing with her and I circle back to it and I say it isn't indiscriminate and we've changed it. But just, you can watch the whole thing change if you just really say it back out loud to them and not try to just get defensive. Like we don't do that. We don't, you know. And the biggest single output, we, we, we did a little survey of the people who've been through this workshop and basically, Back to the, our colleague from Denmark's point, the, the presumption going into these engagements is like, oh God, I'm going to have to hear some American show up and just lecture me about how great America is. And any, if you just don't do that, you are scoring lots of points on the public diplomacy field. Um, and if you could do something more besides, better yet. Good question. Young guy here with the beard, blue shirt. Uh, sorry to return to historical context again, but um, I'm wondering with regard to Brexit, if you or if one could perceive the leaving of, uh, perceive Brexit and the sort of tensions within the EU within a larger historical context of Europe's sort of consistent failure to present a united front evident at times in the 20th century and beforehand, the sort of inability to unite like other places in the world do have a sort of more unified uh, tendency like China, Russia, that sort of throughout history always find a way to sort of uh, cohesively unify. I mean, I think you'd have a better answer on that one. I think just from my perception as someone who has served in the UK only for three plus years, um, so I don't have a whole lot of historical 
uh, depth to draw on. I think it is really, there's a great cartoon, we were talking about cartoons earlier, um, that, remember, a lot of the people who are arguing to stay in, like the European Union, they would never be accused of loving it. I was sitting next to some guy who wrote a giant check to remain. You know, uncomfortably large sum, and we're sitting in some fancy, the guild hall. An American or a Brit? No, Brit. British uh, financial services guy, and so we're seated together at some dinner. I was like, what are you up to? He's like, I just wrote a big check to remain. And I said, oh, and we we're in this big fancy room, and there was a Union Jack, and there was a St. George's, you know, flag of England, and then there was a third flag, which I think is like the City of London flag. I'm not sure. They all start to sort of blend together. Um, and I said to him, I said, well, can you see one day a fourth flag hanging there? The European Union flag, which by the way, you see in Denmark, you see in Sweden, I mean, it's all over. You don't see it in the United Kingdom, pre-Brexit. And he, he almost took his butter knife and like stabbed me. He's like, hell no. This guy is writing a big amount of check to stay in and he doesn't like it. So, I mean, sorry, he tolerates it because he thinks it's good for business and it's good for whatever, but there's no love from, this is just one example. Um, and so the cartoon was a European flag with a peace sign in the middle, and the European you mean, means for a lot of continental Europeans and many Brits, this amazing, after just two devastating world wars, a bringing together and a system, imperfect as it is, that binds Europe together and gives mechanisms to holding it together. But many, certainly in, in, in Britain's relationship, which has always been rocky, I mean, wanting to get in, de Gaulle saying no, then getting it let in later, it was very much sort of common market, pure, um, no peace sign there. I would say it's a pound sign or a euro sign, you know, or not not euro because they didn't do the euro. Um, so I think if you're trying to get people excited, here's a bad an analogy. If, if those of you who follow football soccer, it was sort of like we ought to stay in the Premier League or we ought to stay in UEFA. It would be silly to pull out because it's practical. But that's not the same as like your home team and the pride and the love you do for that team, I think. What do you think? I've, I've discovered my, I, I basically agree with you, I've discovered my difference from the country that I have hold a passport from, in the sense that for me it is a matter of love and it mm. is a matter of deep attachment, and it's therefore quite agonizing. Mm. Um, but I do agree with you that I think for many people that's an open-ended relationship. Um, but I wanted to uh, wrap things up now by thanking you for joining us, not for the first time, and hoping that you'll come back to see us wherever your future career takes you after the end of this phase, but really to say how lucky and how fortunate I think we've been in having you as an ambassador since 2013. Um, well, it's been you. a real pleasure getting to know you and getting to hear and understand better this modern vision of diplomacy that you represent. And I know that a big part of that is that you like to mingle and talk with people after these conversations. Indeed. So I'm going to get you to that point awesome. right now by asking everyone uh, to join me and thank you. Oh, thank you.